got your toothbrush. Check. Do you have your deodorant? Check. Do you have your cozy clothes? Got that. What? Do they know I'm black? Should they? You might wanna, you know. Mom and Dad, my black boyfriend will be coming up this weekend. I just don't want you to be shocked that he's a black man. <laughs> I ain't never seen you like this before, bro. Meet family and take a road trip. Don't come back all bougie, man. <laughs> <laughs> So you guys coming up from the city? Yeah, we're just heading up for the weekend. Can I see your license, please? He wasn't driving. I didn't ask who was driving. I asked to see his ID. Hungry, my man. So how long has this been going on, this, this thing? <laughs> <laughs> we hired Georgina and Walter to help care for my parents. When they died, I couldn't bear to let them go. Do you smoke in front of my daughter? I'm gonna quit. She'd take care of that for you. How? Hypnosis. I'm good, actually. Are you ready for this? I'm back in the beat. So look, I go do my research. Apparently, a whole bunch of brothers been missing in this suburb. But it's cool. Bro, how you not scared of this, man? Didn't see no brother around here. Chris was just telling me how he felt much more comfortable with my being here. Get out. Sorry, man. Get out! Yo! <laughs> Rose, we gotta go. Is everything okay? Rose, the keys. Just get the keys. I don't know where they are. Rose! Sink into the floor. Wait, 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 wait. Sink. It's a terrible thing to waste. Terrible thing to waste. John chapter 5. If you got your Bibles, John chapter 5. Just a few verses, starting at verse number 10. Say amen when you're there. The gospel according to St. John chapter 5, verse 10. And the word of the Lord declares, The Jews therefore said unto him, That was cured. It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. And he answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? Amen. Just to launch and initiate this God on Film series, we want to try to develop a thought from the subject, who told you you could walk? Who told you you could walk? Come on, say it with me. Say eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive all of the wonderful things that Christ has already done. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you. We give you praise, honor, and glory. For another chance to come into your house, to come into your presence, to be among your people, God, to create worship for you. But Lord, we realize that we were created in your image and your likeness. And so we were created to create. And that creation that we create is worship. So we thank you, God, for this worship ministry here, these worshipers, your people. For your word declares those that worship you must worship you in spirit and in truth. So God, not only do we worship you, but we thank you for a heart and a mind to give you praise and glory. Now, Lord, we pray that your spirit will come into this place, infiltrate this space, fill this space, Holy Spirit, with your presence, with your wisdom, your knowledge, your insight, your impartation, and your revelation for your people. Bless us now, Holy Ghost. Speak to us a word that will change who we are. 
A word that would transform us from the inside out. Speak a word of power into our hearts, into our life, God. That even our words becomes words of power, words of authority, words of effectiveness that changes the environment and the atmosphere in which we stand. We bless you now and in the name of Jesus. We rebuke every demon, devil, every foul spirit, every wicked thing, every wayward imagination. We rebuke disease and sickness. The devil is already defeated and we declare that we are blessed. And so we thank you, Holy Ghost, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Who told you that you could walk? All right, so let's jump right into it because our time is, is ticking and clicking. Amen. This is the first entry of our sermon series for the summer. It's been several years since we've done it, but there was a couple of flicks and movies and shows that came out that inspired us to come back and do God on film again. And so in this series, the initial film that comes into question is Get Out. How many of us have seen Get Out? Praise the Lord. All right. If you had not seen it, go, go check it out. This, this is a pretty interesting movie, somewhat of an intriguing movie. And there is a particular scene in this movie, which is the most iconic and popular scene from this movie, called The Sunken Place. Amen. Is there anybody in the house that's ever been in a sunken place? I don't have any witnesses. I know you were born saved, and I know you were born Holy Ghost filled. I know you were born with everything right in your life. I know you were born with all of the money you need, all of the other resources you need. I know you were born with confidence and courage, but there's some of us who we spend a little time in the sunken place. And I don't want you to believe that once you get saved and you give your life over to Christ and receive his life, that you're never going to find yourself in a low place. This is why David pins and he says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death. I'm already preaching. I don't have to fear any evil. I don't have to be worried because the Lord is with me. That, that's the message for somebody. Before I get to this other stuff, I want you to know right where you are in your sunken place, in your valley experience, the Lord is with with you. I need to say it again to somebody over here so you can realize it. Whatever you're going through and experiencing, do not worry, do not fret, because God is with you. And David says, yea, though I walk through, good God Almighty, that means I got faith and I believe it ain't gonna always be this way. Though I walk through, that means I believe that trouble don't last always. Though I walk through, I know that weeping may endure for a night, but when I get through this, when I get on the other side of this, there will be joy. That wasn't even in the sermon. But that's what we need to do today is to seek God to give us a word and the power to get out of the sunken place. This, this particular scene in 2017, the L.A. Times hosted a director's roundtable. And both the writer and director, the award-winning writer and director, Jordan Peele, of this film was making some comments, and he had a couple of quotes about this particular scene. He says, you know when you're going to sleep and it feels like you're about to fall? And you wake up. Y'all know how it is when, you, when you're nodding? Is it just me? Has it been anybody else in here? He says, when you're going to sleep and you feel like you're about to fall and you wake up, that feeling. But he says, imagine... If you never wake up, oh my God, that's somebody's experience right now. You've been falling and you just feel like you can't wake up. God, I'm falling and I can't wake up for this nightmare. My, my relationship with my children is falling and I just can't seem to say the right thing. I can't seem to do the right thing to wake up out of this nightmare. He says, it seems like you're falling, but you just can't wake up from the nightmare. Peel goes on to say this. He says, as I'm writing, it becomes clear that the sunken place is a metaphor. This ought to catch all of us in here. It's a metaphor for the system that is suppressing the freedom of black people, the freedom of Hispanic people, Mexican people, Asian people, Indian people, the freedom of white people. 
It is the system that is suppressing the people of God. It is the kingdom of the enemy. It is the principalities of the prince of this world that is suppressing the people who are citizens of the kingdom of God. He says it's a metaphor for the system that is suppressing black people of many outsiders and many minorities. He says this whole sunken place is a metaphor. This scene is a metaphor. Is there anybody in this room that because of who you are or who, uh, what your color of your skin, because of your gender, because of your social economic status, you seem like you've been suppressed. You've been, you've been marginalized. You've been blocked out. You've been locked out. You've been excluded. You, for some of us, because of your condition, you've been precluded. Y'all not going to say amen. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't talk the right way, so that's why they don't let me uh, be a part of the things that they do on the stage. God Almighty. And if that were true, then that means I couldn't be up here because I don't talk. For all of you scholars who graduated over the last couple of months with all of y'all's diplomas and degrees and everything else, I don't talk that way. I say it the way God gives it to me to say. But, but, but is there anybody else in here that's ever been suppressed because of who you are and what you are? Come on, somebody, you, if you, don't, you can't relate to that, you remember when you were a child and, and you wasn't quite old enough to run with the big kids? You know, you felt you could ride a willy just as long as Pee Wee could ride a willy. You could ride a willy just as long as Run Run could ride a willy. But, but because you were so younger than them and, and, and the power and the grace and the gift that God put on your life makes them look bad, they try to suppress you. Ain't nobody going to say amen. He says it's a metaphor for a system that holds people down, a system that traps people. Yeah. Going on, Peel says about this scene, he says, the reason Chris, which is the lead character in this film, he says, the reason Chris in this film is falling into this place is because he's being, f and being forced to watch this screen uh -huh. is that no matter how hard he screams uh -huh. at the screen, he can't get agency across. Boy, that's a strong statement right there. That, that's somebody's testimony. I don't know if you've ever been in that place. It doesn't matter how hard you scream. It doesn't matter how hard you talk. It doesn't matter how hard you cry. It doesn't matter what letters you write. It doesn't matter what emails you send, what text messages you send. You just seem to not be able to gain agency. And when I say agency, I'm talking about power and authority to get across what you are experiencing, to get across what you are feeling. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. And so Bill's quotes kind of brings us to our text. The Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 5, it says, And there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. Watch verse 2. Now, there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda. And Bethesda means a house of grace, a house of mercy. And, and having five porches... So this is not the same kind of porch like your big mama's porch, but it's more of a colonnade or a portico or, or a covering that is supported by columns that surrounds this pool. It had five porches. And watch verse 3. And, and in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, of halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. In this situation, in this circumstance, in this environment, they're lay. If you're laying, then that means you're not moving. If you're laying, then that means you're not active. Watch this. They're lay a bunch of impotent people, a bunch of halt people, blind people, and withered people waiting. That, that, that's some kind of environment. A, a multitude. Here's what Big Daddy taught me. He says, if you got nine broke friends... Somebody in here know the rest of it. You bound to be the 10th one. All, all I'm trying to say is look at this environment. Look at the type of company that is in this place. A bunch of impotent folk. 
Impotent meaning not powerful. They have no power. They have no agency. A bunch of blind people, people with no vision. The devil is a lie, not here at Trinity Harvest. There will not be powerless people in this church. There will not be visionless people in this church. There will not be crippled people in this church because of the power of the Holy Ghost that is resting in us. We will stand up and we will be what God has called us to be. Big Daddy said, you got to check your environment. And that's what I'm coming in here to tell somebody. You hanging out with the wrong people. In the wrong place. If, if the people you hanging out with are always complaining. If the people you're hanging out with are always pessimistic. If they always see the negativity, they, those are not people of faith. Those are people of fear. Those are people of frustration. But I don't want to be around some people of faith. Not a bunch of blind visionless people, not a bunch of crippled people who can't move, not a bunch of people who are all withered up. Their faith has withered up. Their positivity has withered up. Their outlook on life has dried up and withered up, and they're waiting. The preacher came in here a few months ago and told us, he said, look, God, uh, you're not waiting on God to move. And that's not what Pastor Tim told us. He said, God is waiting on you to move. And God deliver me from a bunch of folks who's waiting on God to do what God has already empowered them to do. Boy, I'm preaching better than you saying amen. I didn't know you wasn't going to like this one. He said, in this, these porches was a multitude of powerless people, visionless people, crippled, withered people waiting. What was they waiting for? Verse 4 says, For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. And whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatever disease he had. Listen, I don't want to be connected to a God that only has the power to deliver you and not me. See, see that, there's some people in here right now, I need, to, I need to wake you up, and I need you to understand that you need to, listen, listen, don't look at my life, don't look at the next man, the next woman's life, and see the success and the blessings and the power and the glory that God has put on their life in envy. See, a faithless person falls into jealousy and envy, but, but, but you need to look at their life and say, man, I see what God is doing in your life. And, and can I just talk to you not about what you got? Not even about how you got it. Let me talk to you about how you believe. Was it always this way? And how did you believe? What did you believe? God, I'm preaching better than you saying amen. Because you have to be careful. And understand there's a difference between what you're believing for and what you're believing in. So you got a multitude of people who've been hanging out day in and day out, week in and week out, month in and month out, year in and year out, at this pool waiting for an angel to come and trouble the water. See, my point is, if you believe too long for something and don't understand and realize who you should believe in, then you'll start believing for it to the point where you believe in anything. See, some of us, we come to church and we're looking to God and we're believing God for but we don't even believe in the God that we're believing him for. And when we can get our right connection with the power of the Holy Ghost and we believe in him, all things are possible to him that do what? Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so here these people are, year after year, coming to this pool. And here's the thing. We have a tendency to believe things with no evidence. We just believe it because somebody else said it. No, they told me, they told me that Leroy, Leroy been dead for 20 years. They told me when Leroy, Leroy came down here, man, he got in this pool, it was early in the morning. And you know, Leroy had that crooked foot. Y'all ain't going to say amen. Everybody in here got somebody in your, <laughs> oh, y'all hear what I'm saying? That had some type of ailment. If it wasn't a foot, it was an arm. If it wasn't an arm, it was an eye. If it wasn't an eye, it was, y'all understand what I'm trying to say in here? You got to be careful and not just believe God for. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God is not impressed for your faith in stuff, your faith in things. God is impressed by your faith in him. 
And when you begin to believe in him, then God can respond to your faith and make a miracle in your life. Because then once, once it gets that way, the you, 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 only thing you can say is, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, the uh, only thing you can say is, can't nobody. See, when you believe in him and you know that it was the Lord that changed your life, you know that it was the Lord that made, your way, made a way for you, you don't just fall for anything. No, no, it ain't because I'm so skeptical and I'm so nervous, but I keep getting these text messages telling me that I need to go and verify my Facebook page. Why I got to go verify a Facebook page that I didn't have for 10 years? Y'all missing what I'm saying. You know, get these people who call the phone and say, listen, you really need to call us back. There are some problems with your social security number. And many of us are falling for these things because our faith is not solidified in our Savior. Let me have that cup right there. Are y'all still with me? So it's not just believing for, but more so who we're believing in. And so watch, he says, he says, a certain man, verse 5. This is John saying, a certain man was there which had an infirmity. And it wasn't just for a couple of hours. It wasn't just for a few weeks. It wasn't for a few months, but he had this infirmity for 38 years years. God Almighty. I submit to you that there are some people who have been going to church I, 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 I'm sorry to say this, but there are some churches that's just like this pool. Got a multitude of people who gather every week. But they're, they're blind. They're impotent. They're halt. And some of us have been going to those churches for 38 years and still have an infirmity. This is the day. This is the church where the Lord is going to change your life. This is the day. This is the church where God is about to deliver you from your infirmities. Do I have a witness in here? So he says, a certain man uh, was there. He had an infirmity for 38 long years. Here's the thing. Think about this situation. If you have an infirmity for 38 long years, that word infirm is the preposition in, which means not, right? And firm means stability, stable, strong, strength. So basically he's saying there was a man who didn't have strength. There was a man who was weak and didn't have stability. And he had that lack of strength and that instability for 38 years. Listen, listen, money is not the root of all evil. In fact, when people quote Paul and say that, it's a misquote. Paul says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And because we have this misinformation, this misinterpretation, and this misapplication of what Paul is saying, then we apply it in our lives in the wrong way. And we start thinking that if I have money, that must mean that I'm evil. And we start equating money with evil. And money is amoral. Money is not evil. It depends on what you do with the money, whether or not you are evil. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And many of us in our money, we are not firm. We're not stable because I got this little piece of money and they saying it's time to give. And I'm thinking like, man, I ain't got anything to give. That's because you believe it in your money and not believe it in your God. I need to press on because y'all don't like that kind of stuff. He says a certain man was there which had an infirmity for 38 long years. And you got to think about this when with this infirmity. It caused him to not be able to move. He wasn't ambulatory or mobile. And because of that, he couldn't do the things that we normally do, taking that for granted. You know, the things that we just take for granted, these were things that he couldn't do. You know how you just walk yourself in the bathroom in the morning and just brush your teeth? These were things he couldn't do. I wish I had somebody. And because he couldn't do these things, he was not able to engage or fully engage in active life. He was more than likely a poor man. He was more than likely didn't have all of the things that he needed because of this infirmity. 
And some of us, though we are, are able to brush our teeth, though we're able to go to the kitchen and get a glass of water, there's still some things that we're not able to do and that we're not experiencing. Are oh, you hearing what I'm saying? Because of our infirmity. Maybe it's not a physical infirmity. Maybe you have a faith infirmity. Maybe it's not a physical infirmity. Maybe you have a prayer infirmity. Maybe your infirmity is that you're malnourished. You don't read enough word. You don't get enough bread. You don't get enough teaching. You don't, I wish I had somebody in here. And because of your infirmity, you're missing out. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. You, because of your infirmity, you've been missing out. Jesus says to Nicodemus over in John, the chapter 3, if you go two chapters back, he says, Nicodemus, as Nicodemus comes and says, man, look, you got to come from God because can't nobody teach the things that you're teaching and do the things that you do unless they come from God. He says, Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except you be regenerated, except you be born again, you can't even perceive no, no, you've been missing out. You can't perceive that there is a such thing as a kingdom of God. And then he says, in confusion, he says, how, I, I don't get it. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? And Jesus says to Nicodemus, he says, Nicodemus, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter. You got to be born again just to see it, but you got to have his word and his spirit to engage in it. And some of us are missing out because we pass up the word. Anytime the word is being taught, anytime the word is being declared, you can't find us. But let us play some songs. <laughs> and I'm saying this, it's over for that generation. That don't mean that we're not going to shout. That doesn't mean we're not going to give God praise. That doesn't mean that we're not going to speak in tongues. But there's going to be power in our shout. There's going to be power in our praise. There's going to be power in our tongue. I wish I had somebody in here dancing all over the place, running and shouting all over the place, and your life is still raggedy. It's over with for that generation. I wish I had somebody here say, God, deliver me for that generation. Because when I shout, I'm expecting things to change. When I praise, I'm expecting my life to change. But these allergies don't want me to teach this. Am I doing all right? So the Bible says, certain man was there, which had this infirmity for 38 years. But then verse 6 says, when Jesus saw him laying there and knew that he had been a, now a long time in that case, he said unto them, him, will thou be made whole? Listen, I know because of the infirmity you've been missing out, but I want you to understand something. Jesus, God, the, the, the impotent man answered. This was the point. Jesus wants you to, to stop missing out. That's the point I was trying to get to, right? But, but, but he says right here in verse 6, when, when Jesus saw the man and knew that he had been lying now a long time in this ca that case, he said unto him, will thou be made whole? That's the question. Because most of us, if not all of us, came in here with an infirmity this morning. And we've been limping the church. We've been crawling the church. With the same weakness, with the same problem, with the same ailment, with the same spiritual hurt, with the same emotional wounds. And Lord is saying today, I want you to stop missing out. And, and he's saying, will you be made whole? Look at this question. In other words, God is saying the choice is yours. See, we, we've been coming to God as if God was this mean, stingy, divine being standing up in heaven and, and barely passing out blessings. God, I, I, need, I need you to save my children. Mm -mm. God, I, I mean, I, I, Lord, I don't even really want more. I just want this car to act right. Mm -mm. That is not the kind of God that we serve. 
We do not serve a stingy God. We serve a merciful, gracious God who is waiting for an opportunity to bless his children. So the question is, not can I heal you? Not can I make you whole? Not will I make you whole? But will you? Will you submit? Hallelujah. Your faith and believe in me. Will you be made whole? Come on, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, will you? Oh, they, they didn't like it. Look at your other neighbor. Look at your other neighbor and say, neighbor, will you? Jesus saw him in this situation. And he asked me, he said, will you be made whole? But much like us, we are focused on what we're believing for. And missing the one that we should be believing in. Who can easily give us what we're believing for is present and says, what you want to do? I'm saying how your stuff is going. I'm saying how your life and your marriage and your relationship is going. What you want to do? I'm saying how your health is going. What you want to do? Will you be made whole? And just like us, he responded, well, see, here's the problem. I would, but... Pastor, I would have been at church, but Pastor, I, I would have I would have gave to the uncommon resurrection seed, but but that's what he says. And then the impotent man, the powerless man, when you are when you are giving those excuses, listen to me. The fact is, you don't have the money. But the truth is, God has everything you need. Oh, you hear what I'm saying? And here's the deal. The facts can never change the truth, but the truth can change the facts. The fact is you're still in bondage. But the truth is, who the son sets free is free indeed. So when you can take the truth and apply it to your facts, your facts begin to change to reflect his truth. The powerless man said, uh, sir... I have no man. And I could just imagine Jesus saying like, bruh, you don't understand the man is standing right here before you. And this is what you say. I have no man. I just, I mean, I, I just get so lonely sometimes. And I mean, the thing is, I look at Lady Tony and she got Pastor Ray and I have no man. First of all, first of all, first of all. It's only one Pastor Ray for one Lady Tony. That's number one. And, and I, I, I encourage you not to focus on getting a man, but focus on getting the man. Because once you have the man, then when a man that he has chosen for you shows up, you'll know that's the man for me. When a woman that he has chosen for you shows up, you'll know that's the woman for me. He says, he says, I have no man. When, when the couple's ministry get together, I don't go because I don't have no man. Might make sense, but you understand what I'm saying? Because we start speaking these things, and the more we speak these things, the more they become our solidified reality. Are oh, you hearing what I'm saying? See, see, the power of ideas, I just learned this the other day. Dysfunctional disbeliefs, believing that it's like this and it always has to be like this. And the longer I focus on it being like this, then I begin to believe that this is the way it always be. And, and then I begin to believe that there is no hope and there is no help for me. And, and the power of ideas is when the idea becomes that this is it, this is all there is, then that's what I submit to and I embrace and that becomes the solidified reality in my life. Y'all missing out what I'm saying. Have you ever showed up at a restaurant and then you had the food 
and you didn't even know the restaurant was right around the corner from your house? And you say, I've been living in this neighborhood 38 years. And I had no idea that this restaurant was here. So what the restaurant offers, what the restaurant provides in heavenly divine food and word, you had no idea because you thought your neighborhood didn't have bread. You thought your neighborhood didn't have services. You thought your, God almighty. But when you, you began to think differently and you began to say, God, all things are possible for you. And I know that I'm in this hard situation, but whatever idea I don't have, God, I know you got an idea. And what I'm saying is, God, can you give me some ideas on how I can transform my life? Give me some ideas. Serial entrepreneurs, that's all they are. They're idea factories. Or they have a keen ability to look at a current and an existing situation and say, huh. And since they are optimists, and since they are entrepreneurs, they say, I bet there's a better way we can do this. I, I, I bet you there's a more efficient way. There is a more proficient and productive way we can do this. Because I was with my friend over here, the computer tech, and he wrote a program. Ain't nobody going to say amen. And, and if I can do what by association, if I can take this computer program and take this particular industry and put them together, we can make this a whole new industry. That's what's called disruption. Y'all know everybody always references Uber. Uber took some software technology and an existing transportation or transit system, put them together, and created a whole new situation that disrupted the industry. Y'all missing me. I'm saying your life is the industry. The way you're eating, the way you're sleeping, the way you're dressing, the way you're walking, all of that is industry. But when God gives you an idea, I got a couple of people who feel like what I'm talking about. So let me just talk to these people, sis. This don't mean none to the rest of y'all. God is about to drop some ideas in your life that is going to disrupt your whole industry. God is about to drop some ideas in your life that's going to give you solutions and give you answers to the world's problems. And people are going to seek you out. They're going to come looking for you and say, hey, you got any ideas on how we can fix this organization? You got any ideas on how we can get access to this resource? You got any? I, I wish I had somebody. In here. All right. Y'all want the poor man's preaching. Now, that's real. Because that, that I was just preaching right there was for people who got a heart and a passion and know God called you to more than just this. So all you folks who understand and got that word, high five me out the service because that word was for you. Now let's get back to the poor people preaching. God Almighty. He says, I don't have nobody. When the water is troubled, this thing that I've never seen happen. I don't have anybody to put me in the pool, but while I'm coming. So he wasn't completely immobile, but he was just slow. I said, while I'm coming, somebody else steps in before me. And then they're the one that receives the blessing. But watch this. Jesus wants you to stop missing out. Right. And, and, and here's the thing I like about this particular text. Jesus saw the situation, asked the guy, will he be made whole, realized that his focus was in the wrong place and his faith wasn't in, in the right thing and didn't even worry about his faith. I, some, there's somebody in here, God is saying, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna bless you, I'm gonna heal you, I'm gonna deliver you, and it ain't gonna have nothing to do with your faith. I, I'm gonna bless you, I'm gonna heal you, I'm gonna deliver you because that's who I am. That's what I do. God Almighty, I wish I had somebody could say, I'm ready to step into who he is. I'm ready to walk into what he do. I know that's not good English. Right? But I'm ready to step into what he do. And so he said to him, Jesus said, rise up, get up. I don't know who I'm preaching to in here today, but that's the word for you today. It's not get out, it's get up. Because you can't get out as long as you're still laying in it. You can't get out as long as you're still entangled in it. The first thing you got to do is get up. Come on, high five somebody and tell them, say, get up. Look at your neighbor, tell them, say, get up. 
It's time for you to get up out of that depression. It's time for you to get up out of that despair. It's time for you to get up out of that negativity. It's time for you to get up out of that department. It's time for you to get up out. Jesus wants you to stop missing out, Gabby. You missing not because that's his desire. You missing because that's your delusion. You thought you had to get your healing at this pool. And you've been disappointed for 38 years. Because the pool can't heal you. These video screens and praise and worship lyrics can't heal you. This little click, a click, a click, click deal, this, this can't heal you. I can't point this at you. What the hell he That's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. It is the power of God and his word spoken into your life. And when his spirit speaks to your spirit and your spirit cleaves to it and embrace it, then it begins to transform you from the inside out. And that's what heals you. He says, get up. And I want you to take your condition and carry it with you. <laughs> I love this part. Because the very thing that caused them, as Peel says, to be suppressed to be marginalized, to be excluded or precluded, that very condition that, 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 that they couldn't do nothing about. God. Listen, listen, I can't change the fact that I'm a man. I can't change the fact that I'm a black man. But when the Lord speaks, I can pick up my manhood and I can pick up my blackness. Yeah, this, this is the point where everybody ought to be shouting. I can't change the fact that I'm a woman. I can't change the fact that I'm a white woman. But when the Lord speaks and says, pick up your womanhood and pick up your whiteness and... <laughs> I need to preach to this sign. Y'all sound like y'all got it. I can't change where I come from. I, I can't change anything about that. But when the Lord speaks and he says, pick up where you come from. Pick up what you've been through. Pick up all of your hurts. Pick up all of your pains. Pick up all of your scars. Pick up all of your wounds. And is this blessing anybody? Come on, look at your name and say, pick it up. Come on, touch somebody and say, pick it up. We got somewhere to go. Pick it up. Come on, stop tripping now. Pick it up. Pick it up. I, I know they lied on you, but pick that stuff up. I, I know they told a story, but pick that stuff up. I know that they broke your heart, but pick it up. See, see, Jesus, God, he empowers us to do things that we never thought we could do. You're not listening to me. Jesus will give you the power. He will give you the passion and compassion in your heart to love on, not just speak to the chick that did you wrong, not just speak to the people who lied on you, but love on. See, that's real power. That's real power. Tonya, when you can love on the people who you don't like, God will give you the power to pray for. Not pray on, but pray for. Somebody's job situation finna turn around right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless Orlando. God, touch his heart. Touch his mind. I can talk about, y'all understand what I'm saying? That's my house. He says, pick that stuff up. If you don't get nothing else out of anything I'm teaching, I'm telling you, pick it up. But, but God, I'm afraid. I'm not good at that. Pick that up. That's what the Spirit of the Lord is walking in this house right now. Because see, I, I don't know the stuff that he knows about you. And right now, he's bringing it to your mind. He's bringing it to your heart. He's just walking through the house right now. Pick that up. You, you, pick that up. I, I'm going somewhere and I'm taking you somewhere. Hey, stop. G girl, pick that up. Y'all know how when your children frustrate you? That's how God is with us. He's frustrated because the stuff he's given us power to do. When your babies is three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty-one, 
25 and you say clean up your room? Have y'all ever been there? And you come back three hours and eight minutes later and it still look the same? That's how our lives are. Our lives is our room. And the Lord has said, clean up your room. And he come back 38 years later, 38 months later, 38 weeks later, and it still looked the same. And so God get frustrated and said, boy, pick, pick, pick them shoes up. Pick, pick that shirt up. Get. Tell somebody, pick it up. God Almighty. Is this, is this all right? He says, Jesus said unto him, rise, take up thy bed, and walk. I know I've been missing out. But since I got this word, I can walk now. See, that was the encouraging part, but now there's the reality part for us to really step into it. And see, this is the part where somebody, the people who can shout right now are the ones who really got the last slide. I know I was missing out. But I can walk now. Right now. So it's, it's not that this word is going to have an effect on my life next week, next month, in the next 38 years. But when the Lord speaks, it has the power to change your life right now. And now I can walk. Look at what the Bible says. He says, and immediately. God. Oh God. I wish I had somebody who could grab the word that way. When the Lord speaks, you got to look for immediate power. I'm not looking, God, for you to bless me down the road. I'm looking for you to give me power right now. Because I got to get up and get out of this. And I need power right now to get up and get out of this. I need agency right now to get up and get out of this. I need authority right now to get up and get out of this. He says... The Bible says, John says, and immediately the man was what? Made whole. And what did he do? He picked it up. I believe before he was physically healed and made whole, something changed in his spirit. I believe before he was physically healed and made whole, something changed in his mind. Because it had to change in his spirit and change in his mind because 38 years he'd been trying to pick it up. But hadn't been able to. So something had to change to cause him to believe that I have the power to do what this man just said. See, some of us, our mind won't let us try the word. Some of us, we think our way out of our best blessing. God Almighty. And the Lord says, pick it up. And we say, well, I mean, it's a little heavy. Lord said, pick it up. I, I, I tried, but, you know, my, my, the way my back is set up... So something had to happen spiritually and mentally for him to even think. See, he didn't have faith in the beginning because in the beginning he said, will you be made whole? He said, well, well, I don't have no man. But when the word of God, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when he heard God's word in his spirit, oh, God Almighty. And he said, really? Pick, pick it up? Jesus said, yeah, pick it up. You, you mean Jesus, this heartache that I've been having pick it up he's like oh yeah man pick it up so so you for real being broke I, I can, and he said man you can pick it up you can pick up being broke you can pick up your raggedy mama you can pick up your raggedy daddy you can pick up your raggedy husband your raggedy you can pick it all oh, he says the man immediately see I got some this, these are the folks who got it Everybody sitting down, they don't need healing. They don't need breakthrough. They're not in nothing. They don't need to get out. He says, immediately the man was made whole and he picked up his bed. And what did he do? Mm. God Almighty. Everybody that's leaving this building this day is going to be different. You came in like, y'all ready to start the worship? But when you leave here, you're going to be walking. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Straight walking. And I'm talking to that. It's, it's, not, it's not like Quavo and, and Offset and take off. No, no, no. It's not walk it like I talk it. It's walk it like he talk it. He said, pick it up. 
Walk it like he talking. Hey, walk it like he talking. Hey. <laughs> Is this all right, y'all? So here's what happens. There's this environment where there's a bunch of powerless people, visionless people, disabled, and faithless. Jesus steps into this environment. This thing I like about the word, because the word has the ability to come into a place like this with all of these people. And when the word is going forward, it looked like it's just all about you. Y'all yeah. ever had that, 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 you know, like, man, was this dude in the car with us? Yeah. Was he on the, he must have saw it on Facebook. No. The word saw it on Facebook. The word knew what you need when you came in this place. And so the word shows up on the scene in this powerless, visionless, disabled withered faceless environment and the word concentrates on that one man and said look I ain't worried about nobody else in here this is not about anyone else this is about you will you be made whole and the word superseded his excuses and spoke himself into that man's life and that man received the word and as a result of the word he responded in faith, and he picked up all of his hurt, all of his pains, all of his past, and started walking in the word. But here's the problem. Because many of us believers come to churches on Sundays like this, or doing revivals like this, and we get this good preaching, and we ready when we get ready to leave, child, that was, ooh, Pastor Show, he was right in my, man, dude, that dude was right in my stuff, man. I'm, I'm out, hey, bro, I'm picking it up. I'm picking it up. And yes, the Bible says immediately he was made whole and he picked up his bed and he began walking. And then there's this statement right here at the end of this verse says, and on the same day was the Sabbath. It's like, what that got to do with anything? Because if you realize the environment and the conditions and the situations and the system in which he was living, the next verse says, then the Jews, when they saw that he wasn't heartbroken anymore, when they saw that, that, that her life since she left him, God is beginning to bless when, when they saw that his life, since he left them, God has begun. Do you understand something? God never told Abram to take Lot out of Ur. Yeah. There's some of us, we've tried to take things into what God has called us into that he's never called to come with us. And it wasn't until Lot and Abram separated that God began to establish his covenant with Abraham. Oh, you hear what I'm saying? And so some of us, we are all pumped up, excited, and everything else. And as soon as we walk out that door tomorrow morning, and somebody see us walking when they used to see us laying down. Somebody see us walking with confidence when they used to see us so shy. Somebody see us moving with courage when they used to think that we were the one who would step back and say, no, don't choose me. They begin to question it. And they say, man, what you doing? Like, they don't even see the miracle. They're so married to and committed to their system that they don't even see the miracle. They've been watching you be raggedy for 38 long years. And now that the Lord has spoken a word, you picked all of it up, they're uncomfortable with it. See, this is the real good part of the sermon. When you get to the point where you can overcome this and get through this, that's when you'll be walking in real power. Because the world don't want to see you. The devil don't want to see you. The enemy does not want to see you successful in what God has called you to be. So the first thing they do is they say, man, what are you doing? I, I'm glad that Trinity Harvest ain't one of them churches that suppresses a shout. 
that suppresses God's glory. I'm glad that the women's ministry have an actual mapped in, laid in, intentional element of their time together that's called, girl, you did that. I, I'm grateful we got a you did that spirit and not like these folks. I don't give a dang what day it is. It could be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the 92nd of November. If God has spoken into my life, I'm going to walk in it and I'm not worried about you. I'm not waiting on you to be comfortable. I'm not waiting on you to be okay with what the Lord Watch them now. It's, they said, man, what are you doing? It's the Sabbath. It's not lawful. What are you doing? You're a woman. It, it ain't lawful. Prophesying, you just 15. Although the Spirit says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughter will what? What are you doing? You're black. You're white. Oh, because don't, don't fool yourself. There is a such thing as reverse racism. Reverse prejudice. I don't even call it reverse. It's just freaking racism and prejudice. Because somebody else is not black, we're going to act like they don't know. You, you, you ain't black. You don't understand. Maybe they don't understand, but they do have hurts. They do have pains. They do have dreams. They do have visions. And so we should be able to speak into and encourage and support every. You know, hurt people hurt people. And because some of us been black for 38 long years, we try to transfer all of our black hurt. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Yeah. On to other people. But they say, man, it is not lawful because of your condition. This system, don't matter how hard you scream, don't matter how hard you shout, you can't get power across to some people. And so you just have to not worry about these people. Watch this. He said, he answered them. He said, man, I, Hey, listen, the person who made me whole told me to do this. That's how we do. I had enough faith to respond to what he said and do it. But now when somebody is challenging it, now I'm like, oh, uh, no, no, I'm not, I wouldn't be walking on the Sabbath. But uh, you know the guy over there, old buddy? The devil is a lie. If, if Jesus blessed me, I don't give a dang who don't like it and don't feel it. I don't care what time it is. I'm going to shout, give him glory. That arm used to didn't work, but that foot. I'm going to antagonize the enemy with my blessing. I got some ice cream. I got some ice cream. Some of y'all not old enough to even know. <laughs> to even know what that is. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> That's Eddie Murphy delirious. There's a whole lot of cussing in that show, so we can't use that one in God on film. We can't. We can't. He answered him and said, he said, it was a person that made me whole that said to me, take up your bed and walk. <clears throat> then they ask, what man was that? See, those of us who are solidified in our faith, and we understand that, that the only way we're going to have help, the only way we will receive help is if we have it and receive it from those of us who, when, when David says, I can look to the hills from which cometh my help, all my help come." Those of us who understand that, we get like this in verse 15. He says, the man departed and told the Jews it was Jesus. That, 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 that's it right there. Pick it up. And then when they ask you about it, say, don't even talk to me about it. It was Jesus. I'm not trying to qualify. It was Jesus. I'm not trying to make you feel okay with it. It was Jesus. I'm walking like he talking because Jesus said I could. Jesus said I didn't have to be 
infirmed anymore. Jesus said I didn't have to be. This ought to be the part where everybody starts shouting and says Jesus said I could. He said I could be loved. He said I could be blessed. He said I could be anointed. He said I could walk in power. He said I could walk in grace. And now I'm just going to walk in like you're talking. Y'all sit down. Give God a hand praise for the word.